We're continuing our look at the topic of mechanics within Mathematics Extension 2. And just to remind you, kinematics is all about how things are moving, but it doesn't really worry about what the causes for those different movements are. Whereas mechanics is about why, what are the forces acting upon an object that might influence in one direction or another. So today we're going to have a think about concurrent forces, which is where you've got a single object, um, a particle, a body, and it's being acted on in multiple different directions. And and uh, particularly today, we're going to have a look at objects under equilibrium. So all of the objects' um, forces are going to sort of balance out nicely with each other. So let's have a look at two really simple examples that are going to feel a lot like mathematics extension one type examples uh, throughout today. All the examples we're going to have a look at being in equilibrium will sort of be reminiscent of that. But this, the thinking that we're going to develop today is kind of going to pave the way for the thinking that we have for when objects are not in equilibrium and all the cool stuff they do there. That's what extension to explores. So let's think as promised about some pretty simple examples. Imagine an object here, I've got my particle represented here with this fat little dot in the center. And imagine it's being acted on by four forces, one in uh, the north direction, then east, then south, then west, and they're all one Newton. That's the, uh, the force, the magnitude of the force being acted upon in each direction. Now, in this case, it takes very little intuition to say, ah, well, obviously this is an object that's going to be in equilibrium. But looking at a diagram like this, um, it's only because I've given you such an artificially simple example. Even if I make this just a little more complicated, not much more complicated, um, you're going to see that our intuition, just by looking at a picture, is not going to be sufficient. Say, for example, let's think about, oopsie daisy, this diagram here, okay? Now, um, you might say, well, this is not more complicated. It's less complicated. I've got fewer forces than I had before. But it's really to do with the angles here, right? Have a think about this with me. Um, hopefully you can see that on a horizontal basis, left and right, this is a situation that is horizontally balanced because um, you've got this vector here, which is contributing nothing horizontally. And then you've got these two vectors here, which are, or these two forces, I should say, which are symmetrical on a horizontal basis. So, you know, the same amount one is in one direction and you can see they're both one Newton uh, forces here. And the same amount is going in the opposite direction. So horizontally, everything looks nice and balanced. Again, our intuition helps us here with symmetry. But vertically, it's not quite so obvious. You know, how much are they actually pulling in the downward direction? Do these two evenly balance out with this one? It's gonna depend on the angles. If I balance out these angles so they were, say for example, closer to 120, uh, rather, closer to 90 degrees than 120. If for instance, I did a couple of vectors like this. You can see here, if I had forces that looked like this, they're hardly contributing anything in the downward direction because they're almost at horizontal. So clearly this vector up here uh, pulling upward is going to, or this force I should say, pulling upward is going to take over. Um, and I could do this situation in reverse. I could just as easily say, what if I had a pair of vectors that were mostly pointing downwards. This will now look like a grossly unfair game of tug of war, right? In this case, um, there's not much horizontal action happening. It's balanced anyway, but more importantly, they are both virtually completely pulling in the down direction. So it's like two people versus one in that game of tug of war that I mentioned. So in each of these situations, the first one where this angle is closer to 90 than 120, and this kind of situation where the angle is closer to 180 than 120, in both of these extreme uh, examples, it's pretty obvious that this would not be balanced. So therefore, I have to say, well, can I do better than just guessing off the basis of the diagram and hoping that I've drawn it um, you know, to scale enough that it looks like it's right? The tool we're going to use, the tool we're going to introduce that will help us understand both of these situations and ones which are much more complicated, is one that we learned way back in vectors, thinking about uh, these vectors not as forces, but as displacements. Do you remember when we were first thinking about vectors, we could say, oh, you've got a position vector, which means it starts from the origin, um, or you could have a displacement vector, which could be anywhere, and it just takes you from one place to another. It displaces you, that's what the name says, right? Now, these are not displacement vectors, they're force vectors, but if we think of them as displacement vectors, we can use some of that geometric intuition to draw some conclusions about these scenarios and um, again, like I said, help us think about what happens when they're not in equilibrium. So let's have a think about this one here. If I think about these four vectors, not as forces, but as displacements, you can see fairly quickly, I'm going to come to a conclusion as to why this should be a situation in equilibrium. 
If I do the forces one after the other, so if I do the north one, then the east one, then the south one, then the west one, as displacements, watch what happens. First I start here at the origin, where the actual body is, then I go north. And then after that, if I just go clockwise, I'm gonna go east by one unit. Um, it's not a force anymore, so I'm not thinking of them as Newtons. Then I'll do this southward vector, and then I'll finish up with this west vector. Okay, now in this situation, what I have created is a square. Of course, it's a square because I have, number one, all of these vectors being equal in magnitude, but also because they are the, um, they're in the directions of a compass rose, everything is orthogonal and perpendicular. So therefore, you've got these four right angles, and that gives you a square. And what that means is, once I've returned back to the beginning, this is like a resultant displacement, a total displacement of zero, right? You haven't gone anywhere. And that's the same as a resultant force of zero in our original scenario. And that's in fact a really important um, phrase, a resultant force. And because we're talking in vector terms, we will often denote that resultant force with an R for results. Um, it's equal to zero because I've ended back on the origin. Now this is going to be really useful, it's much more useful um, in a situation like this one down here. Um, the first example was super obvious, but this one not so much. So watch what happens when we try and use the same reasoning. I'm going to start from the origin and then I'm going to do the first vector. It actually doesn't matter which one you do or what order you do them in. If I do the first vector, I end up up here and now I'll do the second vector. Let's try and do this quite neatly. Whoopsie daisy, that was not neatly. Let's do this, that's better. And so I'll do that after doing this second motion. So here's the first one, then the second one. Now uh, the thing I want you to observe is that up here I've got this 120 degrees measured from the vertical but my vertical has sort of disappeared. Uh, at least you know this was my, my reference point before that original vector. So what I'm going to do just to help me keep things straight is I'm going to place that um, sort of vertical reference line uh, back in place. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat this process for this last vector over here. And you can see it's going off 120 degrees and again that's also measured from the vertical uh, because you can see that's where I did it from in the first diagram. Okay now what I've just pulled here um, I've kind of taken advantage of the fact that I drew this very accurately but I can geometrically reason my way through why I've created not a square but an equilateral triangle not just it looks equilateral but how can I know? Well, the first thing is, sure, you've got your one, one, and one, but you could connect three lines that all had a magnitude of one and not get an equilateral triangle. For example, you know, here you go, there's three lines that are all magnitude one, but I didn't get a triangle at all. It's all dependent on the angles. So therefore, if I reason through the angles here, what can I see? Well, because I had this first one going at 120 degrees clockwise from the vertical, and this vector is vertical, and then I extended it to go up to give me my reference line, right? What that tells me is I've got an angle in here which I know the magnitude of because angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees. So that gives me a 60 in there. Once I've done that, um, I can notice as well that, you know, because this full angle here is 120, um, I can say because I've got a vertical here and a vertical here, these are parallel lines, right? So therefore, uh, and this is not the only way I could reason it, but there's 120 here and another angle here in the corner that is co-anterior, and co-anterior angles on parallel lines are supplementary. You didn't think this is going to be all about a year eight geometry, did you? Well, year seven, in fact, um, but sure enough, there it is. So these angle properties are important. If that's 60, then I can see that the difference between uh, this angle here and this one, 120 take away 60, that's going to give me an interior angle that I can mark in 60 degrees like so. Now this is fantastic because I've got a 60 here, a 60 here, and because I know what I'm going to get inside here, I know that's why I get this uh, equilateral triangle. So you can see it's not just because my diagram looked good, even though as you'll see, the further we go into this topic, the more important it will be to have a good looking accurate diagram. Um, I actually use geometric reasoning to show this has to be equilateral just like before I get a resultant force r equals zero. Okay so this idea of sort of uh, concatenating or stringing together sequencing vectors one after another like their displacements even though they're actually forces this is what we're going to use this is the tool we're going to use to help us understand um, these situations where you have a situation that you know is in equilibrium or that you want to show that it is in equilibrium. So 